So, yeah, I'm not sure what point the government, the video cut out there, but I was just making this point that, um, yeah, patronage powers, the prospect of promotion is a good way of keeping backbenchers in line because young, especially young, ambitious MPs know their career depends on pleasing the government. The government can choose, the Prime Minister can choose whether or not their career will advance and they'll get a government position. So it's it makes sense, it's in their interests, backbenchers who want to join the government, it's in their interests to support the government's proposals. Um, at the same time, the Prime Minister, of course, also has another very important patronage power, which is the power to create peers, appoint people to the House of Lords, create life peers. Now, many older MPs in particular seek to, quote, retire to the Lords. That is, get a position in the House of Lords where they gain the status of a peerage, being called Sir, being knighted and so on, as well as having their position in Parliament guaranteed uh, for life without the need to fight elections. So, Often with the older MPs, the promise of a peerage is enough to keep them in line. Um, so the younger MPs are kept in line with the prospect of a promotion to government. Older MPs kept in line, prospect of a promotion to the House of Lords or appointment to the House of Lords. We should also add here as well that the government's inbuilt majority um, affects not only votes in the whole House, but also the makeup of public bill committees as well. So committees are structured so as to reflect the overall balance of party strength in the House of a whole, uh, the House as a whole. So what I mean by this is if a party has say 10% of MPs in the House, which is roughly what the SNP have at the moment, they will get 10% of the members of each committee. But what this also means of course is that, that the, the, the government's inbuilt majority, if it has one, and we should always remember that the current government does not have one, but normally governments do have an inbuilt majority, if they have one, this will be also reflected in, in they'll have a majority in every single public bill committee as well. So this means the government, governing parties, MPs, can generally outvote their opposition colleagues within a public bill committee, as well as on the floor of the House, arguably rendering public bill committees relatively ineffective as they're numerically dominated by the governing party. Um, okay, so we've looked at some of the arguments for and against uh, the, the, the proposition that the House of Commons um, is, is effective uh, uh, in its role of, of, of scrutinising, amending, passing or rejecting government proposed legislation. But it should also be mentioned um, that MPs not only get the chance to debate and vote on government uh, legislative proposals, but they can actually also initiate legislation of their own. Now, the most common way this takes place is through what are called private members bills. So these are bills put forward by ordinary backbenchers uh, and they can be on any issue they choose. And the way it works is that each year 20 MPs are chosen at random uh, and they will then be given a chance to introduce a bill of their own. Now some very significant groundbreaking legislation has been passed um, in this way through private members bills including probably most famously Liberal MP David Steele's Abortion Act uh, which actually legalised abortion in this country for the first time in 1967. Uh, more recently, in fact just last month as I speak now, um, Labour MP Geoffrey Robinson's organ donor bill recently passed its second reading in the Commons in February 2018. However, it should be noted that there are many obstacles to private members' bills actually becoming law. Um, so one, of, one obstacle is the limited space in the parliamentary timetable that's actually available to discuss uh, these bills. So although in theory 20 MPs uh, will get the chance to introduce one of these bills each year, realistically, because of the limited time to do so, it's actually only the first few on the list um, who will actually, in, in reality, get the chance to do so before the time allotted runs out. Furthermore, even those lucky few um, who are on the top of the list often find their bills filibustered. You remember what filibustering is? You can pause the video, remind yourself if you want. Um, but this is basically when an MP opposed to the bill deliberately makes a speech that is so long that it fills up all the available time um, that's been allotted to debate the bill uh, and the time runs out before a vote can be taken and then the bill automatically falls. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg in particular, a Conservative MP, has uh, seemingly taken it on himself to make it his speciality uh, to filibuster private members' bills, much to the um, chagrin of the uh, uh, proponents of them. 
Now, another obstacle uh, to private members' bills becoming law is, once again, the government's majority. So, if a government is opposed to a bill, it will generally be able to use its majority to prevent that bill becoming law. Now, those private members' bills which have been successful have generally only been successful um, because either the government have actually come out in support of the bill, um, which is what happened in the case of Geoffrey Robinson's organ donor bill uh, last month. The government actually uh, pledged support for the bill, so Conservative MPs voted for it. Or because they've put the bill to a so-called free vote. A free vote is where the government itself has no official position and each MP is simply told to vote according to their conscience. And this is how the Abortion Act was passed. Nevertheless, private members' bills can be an important way for MPs to get issues into the public consciousness and even onto the statute books on issues which the government might fear are too controversial to introduce itself. So in both the examples we mentioned, the Abortion uh, Act and the Organ Donor Bill, the government would probably have been too scared, if you like, to, um, to have proposed such controversial legislation itself, but were happy to go along with the legislation once it became clear they had public and parliamentary support. So it could be argued that private members' bills can actually be a means of getting things done which would not otherwise have happened and therefore um, are an effective aspect of Parliament's uh, role as a legislature. Okay, finally, let's turn to the work of the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords, like the House of Commons, has an opportunity to extensively debate and vote on every piece of legislation the government proposes. Now, because the House of Lords contains so many specialists and experts in various fields, its opinions are taken seriously by the government, arguably, uh, and its en amendments, in fact, are often accepted. In fact, the House of Lords has a better reputation uh, for serious and informed debate than the House of Commons, whose members, MPs, um, are often too busy to properly inform themselves of the issues or too worried about their careers to rebel and very often just vote as they're told by the whips. So the Lords has a reputation also for being less partisan than the Commons, um, that is less dominated by the parties and the party whips. And this lack of partisanship is enhanced by the large number of crossbenchers. Um, you remember what crossbenchers are? These are Lords who are not members of any political party and they currently make up about a quarter of the chamber, almost 200 of the uh, around 800 members of the Lords are currently crossbenchers, not affiliated to any political party. So that arguably gives the, the Lords more credibility um, because they're then less partisan and more likely to actually consider the issues um, according to the reasoned arguments rather than because they're towing a party line. Furthermore, as Lords are peers for life, remember they're appointed for uh, their whole life, they do not have to worry about being deselected as electoral candidates, which MPs do. If MPs are consistently too rebellious, um, then they might actually be told by their party, well, you're not going to be a party's official candidate in your constituency next time. They'll effectively lose their job. Lords don't have to worry about that. They're appointed for life. So this gives them a much larger degree of independence than the MPs have. And again, that gives them more credibility as a chamber. It means their opinions are taken more seriously, perhaps. So the Lords are arguably very effective at scrutinising government legislation, um, bringing their specialist expertise to bear on government proposals and freer from the control of the party whips than their colleagues in the Commons. Furthermore, they have real power. Not only are many of their amendments accepted, but sometimes uh, their outright rejection of a bill um, <coughs> uh, can lead to its being withdrawn by the government altogether. This was the case, for example, with George Osborne's proposed cuts to tax credits in 2015. Tax credits are a very important benefit for people on low incomes. George Osborne was the Chancellor under David Cameron. He wanted to propose huge cuts to tax credits. Now, the proposal had been passed by the Commons. It was rejected by the Lords, uh, at which point the government actually withdrew the bill. So this shows that, that the Lords do have and can have and do have real power. Uh, and can force the government to change its tune, arguably making them more effective uh, as part of the legislature. However, there are very real limitations on the power of the House of Lords, um, which can be said to limit the effectiveness of their legislative role. Most importantly, since 1911, 
the Lords no longer have the power to veto legislation. Yeah? They can't block legislation, just stop it altogether. The most they can do in the face of a determined House of Commons is delay legislation by one year. That's the extent of their formal legal power. Um, if the Commons are really determined to push through a piece of legislation that's been rejected by the Lords, ultimately they can use the Parliament Act to push it through a year later. This happened most famously with the ban on fox hunting, 2004. The Commons voted to ban fox hunting, the Lords rejected it, the Lords wouldn't back down, so a year later the Commons forced it through, despite the Lords' objections. The second limitation on the Lords' power is that the House of Lords understands that because they're unelected, they lack legitimacy relative to the elected House of Commons. And for this reason, they'll often withdraw their opposition to a bill, bill once it's been considered by the Commons. So this was the case, for example, with the EU Notification of Withdrawal Bill 2017. Um, now with this bill, the Commons passed the bill and amended. The Lords then added two amendments. Um, one was, if you remember, that the rights of existing EU migrants should be guaranteed in law. And the other was that there should be a binding parliamentary vote on the final deal with the EU. So I added those amendments uh, in opposition to what the government wanted, went back to the Commons, the Commons then threw out the amendments, um, and then the bill, this, this is what we call ping pong, when it goes back and forth between the Commons and, and the Lords, when it went, the Commons threw out the Lords amendments, then when the bill went back to the Lords again, this time the Lords did not reinstate their amendments. Um, because the Lords really understand uh, that the elected House has had in that, at that point considered its amendments and the Lords understood that they didn't really have the legitimacy to continue to press the issue. So this is often what the Lords will do. They'll, they'll make their amendments, which are kind of a suggestion, if you like, to the Commons to change, to change their plan. And if the Commons considers that and rejects it, the Lord says, OK, you're the elected House, we'll, we'll, we'll drop the issue now. So for all these reasons then, the truth is that the government, through its uh, control of the Commons, can ultimately overrule the House of Lords. And the majority of Lords' amendments are indeed overruled by the government in this way. Uh, it might be more accurate even to consider the Lords more as, a, as, as an advisor to the government, rather than actually a, an effective part of the, the lawmaking procedure in its own right. 